Happy New Year, everybody. You've reached the No Name Cinema Society, the film review show that dares to dig just a little bit deeper. It is Monday, January 4th, 2021, if you can believe it. And this is episode 63.2. It's our indie spotlight for this set of episodes. And throughout this, our sixth season, we've been watching indies from 2015. Tonight's film is a film called 45 Years from British director Andrew Hay. Hi, everybody. My name is Jonathan Betzler. I'm one of your hosts here for tonight's episode and i've got a couple other co-hosts with me to talk about 45 years my first co-host was recently sent into a tizzy by a letter about the fate of his long lost love zach domingo's here with us ladies and gentlemen hello zach you're in vegas too are you I am. our other co-host has been stuck in a long relationship that may be a lie uh ladies and gentlemen <laughs> devin's significantly younger girlfriend is back kelly o'malley hi Hi, Kelly. You got you guys ready yeah. uh, for the Indie Spotlight tonight? Very exciting. Before we do that, I want to share this, our schedule for this, our 63rd series of episodes. It started on Wednesday, December 30th with the review of Wonder Woman 1984. Tonight, of course, is the Indie Spotlight, and we will continue on Thursday, January 7th with our classic movie discussion of David Fincher's Seven. And next Monday, January 11th, Kelly will be back with us for our sound off in which we're going to do a book review. I'm going to do an obscure movie discovery and we're going to count down the top five senior citizen films of all time based on tonight's discussion of 45 years. What's next on the agenda? Trivia. On the last indie, I talked about how Cresha Fairchild from the film Cresha should have been nominated for the Best Actress Oscar. That was our last indie. And I said, your trivia for this indie did actually receive a nomination in the Best Actress Oscar category that year. And I'm referring to Charlotte Rampling from this film, who was nominated for Best Actress. On our Oscar preview of 2015, both Jay Money and I said she should have won for this performance. Davey actually said she would win, but of course he was wrong as he usually was. Rampling lost to Brie Larson in the film Room, as Jay Money and I correctly predicted. It was Rampling's first nomination and only one to date in spite of her five decade career in film. Uh, Ms. Rampling was also a big part of our 1966 in review for her work in the film Georgie Girl. Jay Money named her as the hottest female from one of our 1966 films. I also said this film, 45 Years, made one of our top tens from 2015. It was as high as number three on Jay's Money's list, and we'll find out if Kelly, Zach, and I agree with that assessment shortly. All right, guys, you ready for the summary? Let's do it. 45 Years, just days before the 45th anniversary of his wedding to Kate, Jeff receives information about the discovery of the dead body of a former love, someone he knew before he ever met Kate. This sends Jeff into something of a tailspin, which exposes cracks in their five-decade relationship that may or may not have been there all along. Guys, how was that summary? Great. Pretty accurate. Pretty accurate. All right, cool. Yeah. I did good. So the first question I always ask you guys before opening thoughts is, had you seen or heard of this movie before having to watch it for tonight? No and no. Never nope. heard it, even though it got a Best Actress nomination. Never. So that brings us to opening thoughts. Um, knowing how terrible her uh, boyfriend is at opening thoughts, Kelly did a really good job in opening thoughts in her past. So I'm going to let her go first. One sentence. How did you feel about the film? It was deep and beautiful. Deep and beautiful. That is one. See how good she is at that? Zach, <laughs> one sentence. It hit really hard. I had no idea what I was in for. All right. So it, it could be very interesting. Now, one of us always recommends it on the uh, indie. So uh, technically, this is not one of my recommendations. It's Jay Money's posthumous indie recommendation. He's not actually dead, just dead to me. To avoid any potential legal issues, I'll avoid replaying you what he said about it on the top 10 of 2015. But those of you who are fans of the show know that he gravitated towards things that were bleak. And that's the word he used about the film when describing it in a positive way when he said it was his number three film of 2015. For me, I also am going to use the word deep. I say it's a rich, deep character study whose impressive restraint gets taken maybe a bit too far. I'll dig into that. Liking to start on the positives. For you guys, what is the number one thing that worked best about this movie? What was the best thing about it? The specificity of both the script and the character work that the actors did. So their relationship. Was yeah, I mean. Like out of this world. I, I could have watched them lay in bed and have a conversation forever. Like it was just so intimate and rich. For me, the, the performances are the driving force of this movie. And they're, they've both been 
uh, you know, actors I've admired for a long time. Tom Courtenay more so, you know, just having more under his belt. And I saw him on stage in 1997 in Art. Do you know the play Art by Yasmina Reza? Yeah, I do. I, I saw the debut in London in 1997 with Tom Courtenay and Albert Finney. It was amazing. Wow. I think, yeah, the performances are the primary success of the film. Both performances made my top five in each of their respective categories, best actress and best supporting actor. It's amazing to me how much they convey by doing so little, so confident in their ability, having done it so long. It's a joy to watch them work. Uh, to me, the film is a true two-hander, but the script chooses to focus on Kate's perspective, and she got the Oscar nomination. So let's start with Charlotte Rampling. Here's what I had to say about her on the Oscar preview from 2015 when both Jay Money and I said she should have won the Oscar for Best Actress that year. That's what I've got as well in terms of should win. I think it's the kind of subtle, nuanced performance that screen acting is all about. I mean, yeah. like, I think it is textbook, beautiful cinema acting. She gives you the slightest hint of what's going on underneath, but she never tips her hand. It's so nuanced and subtle, and she milks those close-ups to the nth degree. I think it's actually some remarkable work. Zach, do you agree with my assessment? I do, yeah. Um, she, I mean, they're both really subtle. The whole vibe across the board from the cinematography to even like the sound design, it's super just subtle. It's her performance and she kills it in those close-ups without having to really say much. It's a master class in screen acting, if you ask me. So, so expressive. Her ability to know when to like keep it close and when to let it out in terms of like what her character is thinking and doing was just like masterful, like you said, a master class. Like it, it was so compelling. But you know, Charlotte Rampling got all the pub for this movie. Tom Courtney, not as much. Uh, and maybe because he's been more well known over the years, but I think he's magnificent. Um, and it's not even told from his perspective. He doesn't get the tight close-ups or the quiet moments to himself the way she does, but his journey is still vivid and thorough. It's a complete characterization with some great, unique, detailed choices that make the character more human. Like, for example, the way he moves in a sort of awkward, bumbling way. The way he wears his clothes that screams someone that's past giving a shit. The casual way he tells a story of the past as if he's seeing it in his mind as he's talking. He has a monologue early in the film that I think is just gorgeous. He was fantastic. Yeah, he kills it, man. The film doesn't really focus on him so much as from his perspective, but he sells it really hard in terms of what he's going through and like the deep process that all this stuff is coming out. I recommend a little more Tom Courtenay because I think about Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner, The Dresser in 1983, and Dr. Zhivago, of course. Just great, great performances in a five decade career. And for Charlotte Rampling, Georgie Girl that I've already mentioned, um, in which she's stunningly gorgeous. Uh, she's a bitch in the movie, but but a gorgeous bitch. And I know that's the way Zach likes him. Uh, you're not wrong. Yeah, what I really liked about him was that I never lost empathy for him. Like, I think he really had the trauma and, like, the love for both women. Yes. He was threatened and he realized how deeply he had hurt his wife. And he makes that shift in the last few scenes. It was so believable because he had threaded that through delicately even though he was like reliving this intense grief. Absolutely. It's interesting because it's not from his perspective at all and he still manages to make that clear. And that's a segue to, I think you talked about the screenwriting a little bit in your opening. I do want to talk about that because I do think there's a choice in the film that I wonder about. It is related to the script, specifically in terms of perspective. Because um, on one hand, I appreciate the commitment to tell Kate's story and not deviate from that. Way too often, films get perspectives muddled by occasionally deviating from whatever choice and taking to a, to a character's point of view that we haven't spent much time with all of a sudden. That's not a problem here. They made a bold choice and they stuck with it and that's fine. But sometimes I wondered in doing so, if they inadvertently invalidated what Jeff was going through, which I don't think is completely fair. It's likely a very intentional choice that's trying to make a point, which perhaps we'll get to in the T word. But I wondered if something more balanced that showed us both sides might have been more interesting, at least to me. Now, full disclosure is, guys, I made a short film about a marriage in crisis and specifically tried to even out both sides to, in order to let the audience make up their own minds. So I understand I'm imposing my own aesthetic, but that's why I said it would have made it more compelling to me personally. It has moments of that journey that he has I find really compelling, but I also wonder if it inadvertently, like I said, invalidated his point of view. Or right. I hear what you're saying, and, and I just think it would be a completely different film. For sure. Because uh, what I think is fascinating is 
he's still written and the actor still makes acting choices to fully round out this human being. But the story I feel like is more about like being on the outside. How can you really ever know somebody? It puts us on the outside with her, but like we're on the outside of everybody in our life. How can we ever know anyone? Yeah, and I don't disagree that it would have been a different movie. I'm, but I, I think that small change or smallest change would have made it slightly more interesting to me. Like it, it's, and it's a quibble. Like I'm not saying like this was a terrible movie, but I, you know, I was interested enough that I, I would have been more interested personally about the balance. I don't think my movie would have been a bad movie. Like it would have been a different movie to your point. Yeah. Zach, what do you think about my idea of getting a little more of him and his perspective to sort of balance it out? I, I agree with Kelly, actually, especially with, uh, you know, in terms of how the information is revealed to, um, there are certain moments to, to that really hit harder. You're right there along with her of like this pain. Like it keeps you on the outside enough where, um, I think everything hurts a lot more because of that. You said you're right there with her. And yeah. I'm saying, yes, we were. I would have been interested to be right there with him too. Because there's two sides to this story. But we're seeing the majority of one side. Did you feel any sympathy or empathy for him at all? Or given their perspective choice, did you feel a little bit of animosity towards him? Yeah, I think it shifted throughout the movie. As the more information is revealed, it's hard to be upset with this person who's processing all this stuff that he's like completely hidden and ignored. I got a lot more sympathetic. It makes that ending hurt even more. I do want to get to my primary issue that I hinted at in my opening statement regarding the, mainly the direction and the, and the tone itself. And one thing I will say about the tone is it's very consistent. And I think we've all alluded to that. On one hand, the filmmaker's restraint gives the actors a lot of room and freedom. And given what we've said about the performances, that choice seems to have been successful. It also shows a complete lack of manipulation, allowing us to make up our own mind about things, which I love. However, I would also argue that this Proustian pace may have been taken a little too far to the point where our minds, or at least my mind, starts to wander ever so slightly. It never gets so bad that it becomes a stylization all its own. It never crosses over to being completely unnatural. I just think maybe some of those private moments lingered a few seconds too long. I like slow burn generally, but once we've gotten to the point and had sufficient time to absorb the possible ideas, it's okay to move on. The movie felt extremely slow on occasion. And for me to say that is something because I tend to like slow, but this maybe took it 20% too far. Does everybody disagree with me? It sounds like you guys like it even more than I do. You disagree. I, I disagree. I, okay. I'm someone with such a short attention span and I felt like I had a million things to do and like habitually would pick up my phone, but then like just be putting it back down. I just thought it was so full and rich. The slow pace, it didn't bother me at all. If the movie had been longer, I might be feeling differently. Perhaps. Lean and mean at 95 minutes. I'm quibbling to some degree. I hope it's clear that I do like the movie. It's like 20% too far because I do think that there's moments where we're getting the point, we're absorbing, we're processing. And then it just goes on a little bit longer, just a little bit longer than it needs to for me. Like, I like the idea. I just think they maybe took it ever so slightly too far, Zach. Yeah, I, I get your perspective. I just, I don't necessarily agree with that. I, I was fine with it. From the very first couple shots, I think it really establishes itself as like exactly what you're in for. Like that whole dining room scene was like per almost one, it was just one shot of like, an, a, couple slow pans back and forth, but it's just like them in the kitchen talking. So from that point on, I was like, okay, it's a week in their lives. The lingering and the slowness really kind of facilitates that more uh, in terms of like kind of fleshing them out as just real human beings. Camera choices I really enjoyed. Like to achieve this tone, director Andrew Hay does very little cutting within scenes. You talked about that the opening, it was just one shot. Most of the scenes are done in one long take usually very wide shots or those lingering close-ups on Charlotte Rampling. And most of the action in the scene takes place in a single shot most of the time. Furthermore, and you alluded to this as well, Zach, is he'll often set up shots that frame out Tom Courtenay altogether. A great deal of his dialogue comes from off screen and he'll allow Courtney to come in and out of frame, but never as a focal point 
of the frame, reminding us of whose story this really is. He'll move the camera sometimes. I think it's actually like slow dollies laterally across the room, but it always keeps rambling in frame and usually only when wide, framing her in the space of the life they built together for the last 45 years. I really liked some of the choices that they did with the camera. Same with the pacing. It helped emphasize, we're talking about 45 years together. So you felt like you were with them for 45 years because of the slow pacing? <laughs> Yeah, but like in a good way. So many of these choices are bold, like to, to not cut within scenes, you know, and, and to not try and manipulate the audience at all. They're bold choices, yeah. Some most of which I think worked. And it's just like the one lingering stuff that I thought maybe was too much. But I also want to point out that several points in the film, characters tell stories about the past. Countless filmmakers would have chosen to shoot flashbacks to accompany those stories. And so boldly and wonderfully, I thought it was beautiful and so much more effective to allow us to just listen to the actor, especially those actors, as they told the story. And I already talked about how Tom Courtenay really seemed to visualize the story as he's telling it. And we get to imagine the story for ourselves, the way the listener in the scene does, the way that Charlotte Rampling does when he tells the story. And to me, that's much more involving. It sounds like you guys weren't bored at all by that stuff. Not at all. When you have actors like that, you don't need to. Am I wrong in saying like 90% of filmmakers would feel the need to do that? Or is that crazy talk? You're right. That was like a quibble I, I had with the two popes because they didn't need the flashbacks. I completely like, agree about the two popes. Completely right? agree about the two popes. That really bothered me a lot. Same. Because everything else was so great. Thank I don't know about that. Oh, okay. <laughs> the acting in the two popes was good enough to withstand the last the 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 flashback. It, and it's not necessary to the script because sometimes it is. It's lazy storytelling to me. Completely Actually, agree. Yeah. Zach's upset because The Two Popes is his favorite movie of all time. It's, I'm very mad right now. <laughs> have you seen The Two Popes, Zach? I have not. <laughs> yeah. It's my favorite movie and I haven't seen it. I figured. I mean, I took a chance. Guys, I do want to talk about the ending a little bit, but I also, I mean, like, there's so much T word to unpack. So I want to get to that. And I, it's, it's the movie's five years old and a lot of people haven't seen it. So I want, I don't want to spoil it. Uh, but I do want to give you guys the opportunity to opine because on the top 10 show of 2015, both Jay Money and Davey called out the very last moment in the film as the thing that made the film special for them. And Zach's already brought it up uh, yeah. once. I didn't mind the ending. I, I didn't hate it or anything. I, I thought it tracked. I don't think it suggested anything drastic was going to happen um, the, the way that they seem to interpret it. Uh, I don't want to give too much away, like I said, but being as vague as you can, do you guys have any thoughts on that? It's not necessarily a drastic implication in terms of actions that are like maybe taken after the credits right. roll. It's a pretty drastic implication in terms of like the whole movie as a character study. And then to have that moment, it changes the entire context of the hour and a half that I just put the time into. She emotionally shifted. That was the clearest. Yeah. The guys on the 2015 show felt like there was going to be a major fallout. And I wasn't necessarily convinced of that. Did you still see the love between them throughout? That's yeah. my feeling. I think you brought up the point that he made a shift. It's like he had this wound open up and he needed a second for it to heal. And it's healed now and he's moving on. But even if it's not, I, I think it was important for her to have a moment of knowing this doesn't erase my feelings. Absolutely. So it's not done, but I don't know that that means, and now we're getting a divorce. And that was basically my point. And I, I was mainly curious because the guys on that 2015 top 10 were very confident that wow. that's what it meant. And I'm not so sure. I don't agree with the sense of like, yeah, that's a for sure they're going to get a divorce, but it's just that emotional shift. And for her to be like, yeah, this is not, nah, I'm not okay. All right, guys, we, we got to move on because next section I think is going to be a big one. Kelly, you know it's coming up, don't you? The T word. It's time for the T word. So this is where we explore the themes of the film. So guys, I've got a few themes here to talk about. Uh, you may have some as well. To me, in many ways, it's about the past, P-A-S-T. Uh, you know, it's about how much we allow the past to affect our present. The weight that we give it that can more often than not dunt our future. The past hangs over all the characters in the films, even the tertiary ones, like a dark cloud that follows them around. The past is constantly on display, whether it be through memories, stories, songs, or photos, or very, or very tellingly at one point, a lack of photos. Even the site of the anniversary party was notably the host of the Trafalgar Ball in 1805, as if somehow that makes it a better place to host an event like that. If you really think about it, what does Jeff hope to do after receiving the news about Katya? It's not like he didn't know she was long dead. 
but it opened up that long healed wound and he can't help but wallow, at least for a little. And you know what? I get it. Just this past year, I've spoken to both of you about hearing from an ex I hadn't heard from in about 10 years. Oh, I remember. Uh, even if I were with someone at the time, which I wasn't, it would still throw me. And that probably would have hurt my partner. I probably know it would hurt my partner and I still wouldn't have been able to stop it, at least not at first. Our respective pasts are a big part of who we are. Pain or failures from years ago can make us gun shy to forge ahead, but only if we allow it. Ultimately, we give the past its power and we can also take it away. In this film, at any point, Jeff could have realized there was little point in thinking about Katya much more. There was no action item there. And Kate could have realized that Katya wasn't really a serious threat. But even at their advanced age, they allow their fears to consume their choices. And that's the real tragedy to me. But what do you guys think about this concept of the past and how we let it affect us? You can't argue with that. Yeah, that's like whole friggin' movie. It's too obvious for you? No, not at all. It's something that needs to be discussed. It pervades the entire movie. That's The whole movie is about that. So the I guess only, I got it right anyway. The only thing I would add is, is, and you might get there, is that the past is also tied to time. I don't think I'm going to get there. Can you expand? Oh, so we're, we're talking about like also time weighing on people. Like when he talks about how she would have been this age, talking about like how she's preserved. It is past, but it's also about the passage of time. Here you are decades and decades later, like the anniversary, like they're celebrating time together but they're running out of time as they're getting older. And so they're looking back. The more time that passes, the heavier the weight of the past feels. Right, right. Like I, I think they're tied. Realizing like it's been 45 years since this person was alive. It's almost like that scale of justice to some degree where the more time that passes, the more weight literally that the past has on yeah. your on your life. Because there's more past to build up, I, I, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I got something to add to that too, because I, you know, I think. No, nope, sorry, uh, Zach. Only Kelly can add. Okay, copy. I'll. Sorry. I'll do it. <laughs> Why, thanks. Um, I'm just kidding, Zach. Y yeah, it's like the main theme is the past, and then like that's the big, big umbrella. It all intertwines, you know what I mean? But it's all related yeah, to. The but past. it's a tributary. Like it's it's it comes out of that same river. Uh, I think. Yeah, totally. It's the past in terms of um, what could have been, and possible regrets. I thought about know? calling this regret instead of the past, but yeah. as I started to write it, I, I, I went with the past, but, but but I do think that's also tied. Regret is such a huge thing. Yeah. Uh, you should look at our, our last indie was also, we also talked about regret a, a great deal, uh, Cretia. You should look at that film and that show that we did. That is a big part of it. And I also think that's tied to the past. It's hard to shake regrets you know and it's 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 the the regrets are the wounds yeah tragedies happen and, and that doesn't mean you know he has to live now forever without love exactly exactly and, and that sort of brings me to my other theme um and i'm not sure you're gonna like this one uh kelly uh, but uh, you know it also made me uh question or i think the film potentially throws in question the societal conceit of monogamy and what I mean by that is the script takes great pains to show us that Kachi was long dead before Jeff ever met Kate. And while he definitely didn't tell her everything, he did tell her about it. And in my opinion, not telling her some of the things made sense at times. You could argue that while officially he was faithful to Kate, he committed emotional infidelity in the week leading up to the anniversary because his mind was on the departed Kacha. But I think we need to remember how young Jeff was when he was with Kacha. That first love that we have leaves an impact, especially one that ends as tragically as that one did. His love for Katya was frozen in time like she was in the ice, forever preserved in its youthful, passionate state. Had Katya lived and they married, I'm not sure he or they would have been that different than Jeff and Kate are today. Or if the positions were reversed, if Kate would have be, be the one on the pedestal and Katya the one wondering all the what ifs. All this is to say that I think the film shows us that it is possible to love more than one person at a time, whether from the past or the present. His love of the memories of Katya doesn't diminish his love for Kate in the present. And that's okay, but societal constraints of what love and marriage should be suggest that he's not allowed to feel those old feelings. My point is that as much as he takes her for granted, which he does and is sadly very common for and natural for couples together that long, as much as she feels betrayed, he didn't actually, in my mind, betray her. So guys, yeah. uh, that, that's another thing that I was feeling about the film. 
I don't know why you, I mean, I'm assuming I know why you would think I, I would disagree with you. I'm actually very much of the opinion that once you love someone, you love them and your heart gets bigger and loving someone and being with someone are two different things. We have room for all of those and monogamy, I don't know if that's the right word, but love is a choice. So he chooses to love Kate every day. I don't view it as emotional infidelity to be grieving. Love for sure, but, but to some degree she does, does she not? Does, but that's her own insecurity and her own jealousy. That's the character flaw. Like he's not wronging her by holding space for both of them. Uh, yeah, I agree. That's basically my point. I think we agree. Amazingly, I think we do. Zach, I know you're a big fan of polygamy. You're probably with me on this. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I mean, everything you're saying totally makes sense. You know that's true, but it doesn't necessarily change how you feel in terms of being hurt. It's messy. Everyone's feelings are valid, but it's 100% like she is straight up competing with a dead pregnant woman. She's a ghost. She's a ghost yeah. almost literally in the attic. I agree with that too in like, feelings are valid because I, I didn't mean to, I certainly wasn't like oh. to dismiss her as when I was saying she's dealing with jealousy in this, like it's, it's valid. And if they were both better communicators, maybe they could have gotten there. That's amazing. But, you said that because that was my next, that's my next theme. Should I just set you up? You totally set me up. Segue, literally, I have communication as my next theme. And it's, it's an offshoot. To Kelly's point, I think that's a primary problem in relationships, especially in these British films. It's even more an issue among the Brits, at least the way they depict themselves on screen, often politely playing things too close to the vest and not saying what's on their mind. The best she does at one point is she tells him she wants to tell him how she feels, but she won't. I like literally in the most frustrating way. And he gets it. It seems to be enough for him in that particular moment, but it cuts both ways because he could have very easily explained why this was so impactful for him if he could. She could explain why it makes him feel less than. But they dance about around it in a frustrating way, which is more cinematic and might even be truer to life, but it makes me sad. You know, because we, we try to, we have to try our best to make our feelings clear, e even if they're silly or embarrassing, because sometimes just saying them aloud takes away their power. And it makes the other person feel like you trust them and want them to understand you. Sometimes all they want is to be let in. So, I, you know, that's where I was thinking about communication. It's not as strong as the other things, but it sounded like you thought something similar. Yeah, but actually, now I have a question. Zach, I'm wondering how you interpreted this. But when she told him at the end, I have all these things in my head, but they have to stay there. I took that to mean like she was acknowledging like her feelings are hurtful to him. She's not going to disparage this dead love of his life. I, I interpret it that way too. But, that, but at the same time, her feelings are still valid. I can understand like from the character, someone she like holds things close. Um, her and kind of the culture, I feel like, like it feeling noble. You know, she almost felt bad for feeling jealous of a ghost. Her mind knows, her brain knows that he didn't cheat necessarily. Even if our feelings are silly or embarrassing, it's still important to communicate them so that people can understand. And they can say to us, that's silly. You don't need to think that this is what I feel. I don't feel less of you. It's hard for any of us to do. I'm not sure any of us would have behaved differently, but we should. Like in terms of growing, when I watch the film, it makes me think I should have said this or that to this person. A lot of times I just lash out without stopping to realize what it is I'm feeling and why I'm feeling it. But the film made me think that the healthy thing would have been for her to express herself regardless of whether it's justified. Sometimes it's not the right time to say something and that that's also mature and okay. Oh, for sure, which is why I feel like he didn't necessarily need to tell her no, about he the little didn't. secret Katya died with. But I mean, that fueled her jealousy even more. For oh, her. for sure, especially because they don't have any of their own. Yeah. Um, yeah. To Kelly's point, it's like she might have heard, but it, it's like the gravity is was not conveyed. I agree with that. But I, but I also understand why... I, you know, one might dance around it. You know, sharing sure. it, yeah. 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 one's feelings has value. Yeah. Great. So, guys, here's the trivia for the next indie. Um, and it'll be the final indie to close out our sixth season, another film from 2015. It was a big winner at Sundance that, she, that year. This film just missed my top 10 of 2015 and was produced by the creator of This Is Us. And that'll be in the next month or so uh, on the next indie.
All right, next up, however, is just this coming Thursday, our classic movie discussion, Back to the World of David Fincher with the 25th anniversary of Seven. That's what's coming up in just a few days. Zach and Kelly, say goodbye to the audience. Bye. Bye. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, this meeting of the No Name Cinema Society is adjourned.